So Ephesians 6, starting at verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord, and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. And Father, we pray that you'd just bless as we consider these uh verses, these uh, truths that you've given to us, help us to understand and believe these things and, and help us to apply them to our lives to do what you say here. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're here continuing in the practical section of Ephesians and our passage today speaks of uh, some relationships that we have that that are big relationships that play a big role in our lives, that um, he gives instruction on how, as believers, uh, we should walk in them. I was thinking the first half is, or the first part's about children. And I mean, it applies more than just to young kids, but there, it, there's good stuff in here for parents with young kids and nobody in this room are parents with young kids, so... Uh, maybe some of you will be, and some of us already have been. But anyway, it's still good stuff. So, uh, so first, the first half is about family, uh, and the second half is cut, not half, but the first section's about family. The second section's kind of about work. So, in the first part of family, it's the first part's for kids. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. So, um, of course, when it says children. Um, usually the first thought is little kids, but there's more to it than that. There's, there's, uh, you're always your parent's child. Um, but the obey part in this first half of the verse is clearly talking about kids that are young enough that still live under their parents' authority um, and they live in the same house as them. So for those types of kids, those type, types of children, this, the command is very simple And it's very uh, simply applied. Not easy, but simply applied. God basically says, your parents are the boss of you. They are your authority. Your job is to do what they say. That's your job. It's really interesting when you think about that. In light of the passage right before this. The marriage passage. And then right before that. If you go all the way back to verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. And then wives, so submitting to one another. And then wives submitting to their husbands. And now kids uh, obeying their parents. And obedience is a form of submission. They're, they're very closely linked. So by the time you're a grown-up and you have to submit to one another, or you're a wife and you're supposed to submit to your husband, um, if, if you haven't gotten that down yet, it's kind of on you because God's given you since childhood to learn how to submit, to learn how to obey, to learn that there are authorities in the world. And that's one of the things that's so important about this passage and about, the, and, and about this being a command for a child living under their parents is that this may be one of, one of the most important things you learn early on in life is that there are authorities in the world. It's so important to learn that there's such a thing as authority. And if you don't, and if you don't, and if you don't learn that, and if you don't learn what you're supposed to do in light of that, and that's to respect them, you're going to have a lot of trouble, no matter what, no matter where you're at in, in life. And then even after this parent part, 
we're going to find out there's authorities when you go to work too. So um, anyway, you're, from the young age, the, the, the kids, your job is to uh, see your parents as authority and to obey them. They are the boss of you. So um, p- kids are supposed to do what their parents tell them to do. And, and uh, it says in the Lord. So the idea there is that um, especially if you're a believer, if you're a young child and you're a believer, and, and you know you can be a, a believer as a young child, this is a huge part of your obedience to God. This is a huge part of your discipleship in your own life to the Lord. It's primary for a child to be a follower and a disciple of Jesus that uh, one of the great expressions of that for that child is, I do what my parents say. And so... Um, it, it, it means your worship to God as a Christian means obeying your parents. And it's easy to see that for a little kid. You know, little kids, they, they get that. They understand that. Kids understand that pretty early on, unless the uh, parents are like absolutely negligent, kids get this. You know, kids get when the mom and dad, they might not want to do what mom and dad said, but they understand mom and dad tell them to go to bed. Mom and tell them, dad tell them to get dressed. Mom and dad tell them, brush your teeth. Mom and dad tell them, get going. You know, don't hit your sister. You know, turn off those video games. You know, uh, take a shower, clean behind your ears, all these different things. And, and, uh, and so they get that young. And then it continues into the teen years, even though you're not a little kid anymore and you're, you have more independence. You're able to do a lot of things on your own by the time you're a teenager. You're supposed to still do that. You're still supposed to do what your parents say. And you're supposed to do that, you know, um, without giving a bunch of grief by challenging them about it all the time. Just do what they say. And you might disagree. But it doesn't say anything about that. It doesn't say uh, never disagree. It just says obey your parents. And so um, it's okay if you disagree. It's okay if you think some of their commands are not fair. Um, A kid's still supposed to do what their parents say. And then he says, why? He says, for this is right. And that's really simple, too. That means because it's a good thing to do that. And uh, I I don't think there's anybody that would really disagree with that, like if they really thought it through. It's a good thing to do what your parents say. Here's some proverbs on that. Proverbs 10.1, a wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Uh, Proverbs 20.20, whoever curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in deep darkness. Uh, Proverbs 23, 24, and 25, the father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who begets a, a wise child will delight in him. Let your father and mother be glad, and her who bore you, Rejoice. So it's a good thing when, par- when kids are obedient to their uh, parents. Obedient children are a blessing. Um, a, a good child stands out. And, uh, and, and the reason why they stand out is because there's not all of them are, right? Not all kids are well behaved. They're not. Some of them are just more rascally than others. So, um, and, 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 you know, and it's, and it's not pleasant. You know, when you, you, see a, you see a kid acting out and not behaving, what do you think of that kid? Well, there's lots of things you might think about that kid. What's wrong with that kid? Somebody slapped that kid. Where's that kid's parents? You know, stuff like that. And, uh, but, but so um, God says you, to the kids, you need to behave. You need to obey what your parents say. Um, now, I'll say it anyway. I don't know how how important this is to say. I don't know. But just as with wives, there are extreme cases where you can disregard this. It's so it's true with kids, too. I mean, if the if there's abuse, you know, if there's physical danger in the home, uh, uh, if the parents are trying to get the kids to sin or something like that, obviously, um, those are the extreme exceptions. Um, but the, uh, um, hopefully those are rare. And usually if those things are going on, hopefully, you know, other adults are around to find out and help the kid out at some point soon. 
but the basic instruction is there, and it's based on the fifth commandment from the Ten Commandments, verse 2. Honor your father and mother. And, that, and he says, and that's the first commandment with a promise, that it may be, and the promise is that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Now, that commandment, honor your father and mother, the fifth commandment, that is for all people regardless of their age. Um, people are to respect, uh, bless, seek the well-being of, honor their parents their entire lives as much as they're able. And what that looks like practically will depend on your age and you know, do you still live at home and things like that um, and your circumstances. So we already talked about what that looks like for a child, young child living at home. It means you have to do what mom and dad say. But, but it looks a little different when you're older. You're still supposed to do it. You're still, still supposed to honor your mother and father. Um, uh, some of the ways you do that when you get older is, um, you know, you still uh, do your best to maintain a relationship with your parents uh, as best you can. Sometimes it's not all on you. Sometimes it's on them, you know, but you, you want to do that because that's a way to honor them. Um, you're supposed to continue to be respectful toward them. Um, you know, your attitude toward them, the, the way you speak to them, uh, things like that. Um, I was thinking about, you know, uh, how do I put this delicately as an illustration? Well, let's just say in light of the fact we just had an election. It's not uncommon for parents and kids to disagree on politics. It happens. And, uh, you know, you get into one of them situations. As a Christian, how would you apply this? Well, you might strongly disagree with somebody, you know, your mom, your dad, your grandparents, whatever, about their politics, but they're still your mom and they're still your dad, and they're still your grandpa, you're still grandma. And you just need to be, you need to be uh, respectful to them, uh, even in that. And uh, I remember when, I, I think it was the first time I ever voted for a presidential election. We were somewhere, we were at a family thing, and somehow, like it happens, it came up. And uh, I was voting differently than my grandpa. And he got pretty fired up. And I, I had enough sense to not, you know, challenge him. I was just, you know, how you do it. It's just inside. So I'm just like, oh, he's wrong. You know? But I didn't say anything. And uh, I don't think I said, I didn't think, I don't think I didn't say it because I was familiar with this yet. I wasn't even a Christian yet. But... There's that sense. Everybody knows you're supposed to honor your mother and father, your grandparents. Everybody knows that. So, you know, and then, and then there's another, other ways to respect your grown parents is, you know, give grace to them. What's interesting is when you're young, there's a point in your life, this undefined moment. It happens. I don't know if it happens consciously, but at some point you realize my parents are flawed human beings, right? When you're little, you never think about that. You probably don't realize the day that you realize it, but it happens. And, and then you start thinking a lot about it, and, or you think about it from time to time. You, ne you recognize it more often once you realize it. And then you might even think about, like, well, why did they do it like that? And why didn't they, you know, raise me like this and all, and that and all that kind of stuff? And, and this is where you honor them with grace. And someday when you have kids or you deal with kids a lot, you'll realize why that is so important because you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, because this isn't as easy as it looks, you know, raising these little people. So they need grace. And that's one of the ways you honor, you know, anybody. Can, it wouldn't be hard for anyone to go through and think of all the ways their parents did something wrong raising them. Anybody could do that. Not, nothing, no big deal there. It'd be easy. But we don't do that. That's not how, that's, that doesn't honor them. That's not what God's looking for us to do. Um, and so, um, and then also, you know, there's a point in time where your parents are getting up there in age. 
and that you still honor them and the honoring there looks a little even more different. You know, they helped you go potty when you were little, you might have to help them when they get older. So there's that kind of thing, or at least see to it that they're cared for that way, whether it's you specifically doing it or just you're the one making sure, you know, my, my elderly mother, my elderly father, he's getting taken care of. Um, you care, you honor them by caring for their needs just like they did for you. Um, it could be things like going shopping for them, paying the bills for them, whatever. Taking care of the yard, putting out the trash, whatever they, you know, those types of things. Either do it or make sure some it's getting taken care of. But that is another way to honor your parents. This, this honor applies even if you're a believer and your parents are not believers. That's, there's no exception here to that. Um, and then there's the promise regard, and that's connected to this. God says that you'll be blessed at, for honoring your parents. It, he said it leads to long life. And that's interesting. Is that because God's going to endow you with long life? Or is it because there's something about honoring your parents that actually leads to long life? I think the second one is absolutely certain. And I don't know if the first, you know, if there's some sort of endowment from God because you honored your parents. I don't know if there's, there's a promise there. But we definitely know that it leads to a good long life. So, for example, you're a little kid. A little kid needs to learn to do what their parents say. And sometimes it's crucial for their own life. So, like, if a child doesn't learn young to stop when dad says stop stop what if he's running into the street and dad can see the car coming and the kid can't so there's a sense in which it leads to long life but it's not just in stopping you know a parent one of the things about being a parent is you have more life experience than your children do kid even today i'm 53 years old but my mom still has more life experience than i do and so she might say things to me and I should listen, you know, even as a 53 year old man or you listening to your parents because they have more life experience than you and they've been through things that you are now in. They've been through the age that you're at now. They've been through whatever that you're at now. And if you don't listen, you know, maybe they already learned it. And so they still tell you things. They still try to give you good input. They still try to say things about like, it just never ends, right? We, we, we try to back off when we get older. We let our, ki our adult kids be adult kids, but, you know, we see them doing stuff and we, we just want to give them that input. And the reason why is because we still love them. It, even though they're adults and they're making most of their own decisions and they're, they're responsible for most of their own stuff. And so, it, and it can be a benefit. It can be helpful to listen to them, you know. Um, it, it can lead to a better life, a longer life. Um, okay, so uh, honor your parents as a Christian. This is an absolute must. Okay, now, now for the parents. And, and the first part, the first thing to say about parents um, is implied from the previous command. Um, if a child needs to obey, then that means the parents need to teach their children obedience. Right? They have to teach them that. Uh, kids are sinners. They have a fallen nature. Um, it doesn't go away just because you're a Christian and so now I have kids so they won't be sinners. We all know that. Um, and, and it's not going to go away just because I'm going to do things differently than my parents did when they raised me. That doesn't make it go away either. They're still, your kids are still going to be sinners. So they need to be taught. They need to be disciplined to obey. Um, they don't need to be taught to sin. That comes naturally. Don't have to worry about that. They got that one. They will lie, they will disobey, they'll sneak, they'll do wrong, you know, they'll talk back, they'll have tantrums, they'll do all that. They do need discipline. Uh, here's some proverbs on that. Uh, 13, 24. He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Uh, 19, 18. Chasten your son while there is hope, and do not set your heart on his destruction. And then 22, 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, 
The rod of correction will drive it from him. That one's interesting to me. I think a lot of times young and new parents are in denial about that one. <laughs> oh, my boy, he's a genius. Oh, my little girl, she's an angel, you know? And no, nope, sorry, uh, it says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. That includes yours. Uh, they're little, you got little fools running around. So <laughs> it's there. Um, Proverbs 23, 13 says, Do not withhold correction from a child. For if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that true? Okay. Anybody here ever get physically dif disciplined when you were a child? We won't turn your parents in. Did you die? Did anybody die? I didn't die. Caleb might have died. We brought him back. It says, you know, he's not going to die. He's not going to die. And, uh, and we were all, you know, here we are, most of us sitting here to testify the truth of that. We didn't die. Didn't feel good. Didn't like it. But we didn't die. And so um, this is shocking to our culture. But the reason why is because the culture has it so wrong. You know, uh, just let kids do. They'll figure it out. They don't believe in a sin nature. So they don't understand the need for discipline. They don't understand the need for you know, uh, those types of things. God, God says your s kids are sinners, and he says if you love them, they need some discipline. That's what they need. Uh, and uh, so God's telling parents this, and he's wants us to, he wants parents, don't wimp out on this, you know. They need it. The kids need it. Here's some practical tips as it relates to disciplining kids that are little, young. Number one, be consistent. Uh, don't, don't give up. Don't make empty threats. Kids are smart. They'll figure that out. They'll be like, ah, I don't, he, he just says he's going to do something. He ain't going to do anything. Uh, they learn. They learn that stuff. So be consistent. Uh, when they're young, make sure the discipline is swift. Because if you wait, they won't remember. They won't know what the discipline is for. And that won't help them. That won't do them any good. Um, they won't learn. They won't know why. You know, they'll start to be afraid of you. So make sure it's swift. If you wait too long, you know, you, you need to change course on that. So uh, never discipline in anger. You know, uh, don't, don't do it while you're flying off the handle. That's not a good idea. Uh, it's contradictory to do that because um, if you want, if, you're, if part of the discipline is you're trying to get your child to behave and you're disciplining them in anger, you're not behaving. So that's a contradiction. And so, um, uh, so uh, make sure it's uh, not done in anger. Make sure it's age appropriate. There is age appropriate discipline. Four year olds do not understand a 15 minute long lecture. They, they do understand a swat on the behind. They, do, they get that. Uh, they, they understand that. Teens are not going to respond well to a spanking. You know, there's an age where you just have to stop. And, uh, you know, it's humiliating. It's just going to make them mad. It's not going to help. Uh, so you, you want to correct your kids. You don't want to punish them. It's for correction. It's not punitive. It's not, it's not punishment. Um, wanna, something else, um, you know, after discipline, make sure they know you love them, hug them, tell them, talk to them about why they, you, that you did that, how they, you want them to learn from it. Um, teach them how to repent. You know, if there's something they need to say they're sorry for, have them do it. Uh, let them know you forgive them that, okay, the discipline has been given, it's it been administered, and we are moving on, you know. Uh, if you can't hold it against them, you can't bring it up again because the, they need to understand what forgiveness is about. Um, and so parents of young kids, that's important. Don't shirk the responsibility of teaching discipline. Uh, be diligent and consistent, prayerful and loving. Verse 4, And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. 
Something implied here is that as the head of the family, the dad, uh, it's uh, good for the dad to be the main disciplinarian. It doesn't mean he has to be the only disciplinarian. He shouldn't be. There's going to be times where mom's there and dad's not. But it's a good idea for the dad to kind of lead in this area. Um, it's a fact that, you know, moms are more tender and compassionate. So, um, and guys are a little bit more logical. And so it's, we're wired for this. Um, the problem is a lot of times men can get lazy about this. They don't deal with the kids. They leave it to the wife. Why didn't you deal with him? Why didn't you do something about that? And, uh, she can, and, uh, but, uh, he needs to be very much involved. So, as the head, here's an important point because of that. He's, you know, he's the head. He's the lead disciplinarian. He says, don't provoke to the fathers. Don't provoke them to wrath. Or uh, trans, another way to translate that is don't exasperate them. Don't frustrate them. Discipline them, yes. But don't do it in such a way that they get frustrated. Like, some of the ways a kid could get frustrated is like, I don't know what I did wrong. He's always mad at me, you know, stuff like that. And uh, you need to take care. The, the New Living says it this way. Uh, uh, don't keep on, I don't know if it's the New Living or the Living Bible. I don't remember what I wrote here. But it says, don't keep on scolding and nagging your children, making them angry and resentful. And, and whenever God says something, it's usually because that's something that needs to be said. And so when he says, don't, fathers, don't provoke them to wrath, that means this is a tendency for dads. It's a tendency for dads to do that. And so a father has to be very careful. And, you know, most dads probably have frustrated their kids, more, maybe some more times than they wish to admit. Um, but... Frustrating your kids might come naturally, so you need to be diligent to try not to. Um, how do you frustrate your kids? I mean, when it's, it's the living Bible there, nagging, scolding constantly, being on them for everything, every little thing, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, belittling them, being overcritical, just every single little thing, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, expecting too much of them, not listening to what they have to say. Um, now, there's all little, there's finesses in all these, right? Sometimes you know your kid and you know he's just going to talk back every single time. So you've heard him. So there's that. But generally speaking, you want to let him, you know, say something. Um, but th those are, these are the kinds of things that if you do these, you're not really training your child. You're just frustrating them. Um, some important things for dads to other important things to for dads to remember is um, discipline is for correcting wrong behavior. It's not for vindicating yourself. It's not for you know uh, trying to make yourself feel better because that kid's just driving me nuts. I'm gonna show him who's boss. You know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, the discipline is not for, I'm going to teach that kid a lesson. That's not what it's for. Um, and then also, don't forget their kids. Pretty simple, right? Pretty key. Important. They are children. Uh, they aren't, they're growing up. They're learning things. They're making mistakes. Yes, they're sinners. Yes, they're rebellious. But they're also kids. They're going to act like kids. They're allowed to act like kids. Um, discipline isn't ever supposed to be just because they're doing something that bugs you. Uh, and in light of that, uh, if you are a yeller, you know, a yeller, raise your voice or type per person, uh, pray that God will help deliver you from that because uh, that's not helpful. Uh, tell your kids when you're wrong. That kind of thing. Tell them you're sorry if you did it wrong. You know, you know, sorry, I, I, I was too harsh on you. Whatever. 
Uh, so those are the negative things not to do. And then the positive, it says, bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Training means showing them how to do things. And it's in the Lord, so training them in the things of God. Uh, when, you, when you talk about training, it's more instructive than verbal. There is verbal there, but you want to make sure that you're being an example. Uh, the saying, uh, often more is caught than taught. Uh, there's truth to that. And then there's, uh, bring them up in, in the admonition. And, and admonition means strong urging. And you know, this is where you get close to like, depending on your personality and how you know what you're like where it is you got to be careful if you're strongly urging that you're staying away from that line of frustration or anger or whatever um, but you but we do want to strongly urge them in the things of God strongly impress upon them the importance of a relationship with God and that means you have to speak so there's example and there's speaking you got to do Got to do both. Um, as a father, a Christian man is, has the responsibility to teach his kids about Jesus. Um, this is not something that we just relegate to the children's ministry. Um, children's ministry is a great thing. It's important. But Really, when a, when a father's a Christian, that's just supplemental help. They should be getting the majority of it at home. Now, we have children's ministry because it's good. And, but, you know, ideally the family comes and, you know, this isn't their only spiritual input throughout the week. And if it is, you got to change that. Now, we understand there's all different families. There's different, you know, new believers. People come to church that aren't even really believers. And so from a perspective of a children's ministry, we want to act like this is all they're getting. We want to give them our best. But from the parent's perspective, we want to understand they're getting it from me. And, but you, don't, and you also don't want to be like the kind like where you're like, they're getting it from me, so I don't need children's ministry. What do, they, what do they know over there? You know, that's not the idea. But, but uh, that's, that's just an important uh, thing. And, and getting it at home is important no matter, no matter what. But I would say all the more uh, if the kids go to public school or if they're, you know, involved in a lot of secular activities, maybe sports and stuff, you really want to, like, just really make sure. I mean, when, they, when a kid goes to public school, even if it's a good school and they're not, you know, trying to push all kinds of weirdness down their throat, it's still a secular environment. It's still an environment that they're at for six hours a day, five days a week, and they're not learning what they're learning in light of the gospel, in light of the word of God. They're just not. It might not be, you know, it might be a benign kind of thing. It's not like bad. They're not learning anything bad, but it's, they're not learning what is the most important thing. And that's why uh, it's so important that it's at home. One final thing for parents here. It's a very, very high calling. We are going to make mistakes. We know we have. Uh, don't lose heart. Pray. Uh, love. Love covers a multitude of sins, you know, just like, you know, with the, when we're talking about the wives, when um, the husband's supposed to love his wife so that even if he has to make decisions she doesn't like, at least he needs to make her secure in the fact that my, I know my husband loves me. And, the, and it's the same with parents. Like, it, we're, we're not going to do everything right, but we, we want our kids at least to know absolutely my kids know I love them. You know, the kids know. I know my dad loves me. I know my mom loves me. So next is work relationships. And the first part's to uh, employees. 
Verse 5, bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers. So bond servants. A bond servant was a slave. There were something around, there were around 6 million slaves in the Roman Empire, so the time when this is written. And uh, it was cruel. There was a uh, terrible, slavery was a terrible thing. Not every person in slavery had it as bad as everyone else, but it wasn't a desirable thing. It's a terrible thing. Um, and, the, and, and just to be abundantly clear, the principles of the gospel are very much against slavery. There's people that will read verses like this, where there's instructions for how to treat slaves, and, and, and they, they, all they can think is, it sh- why doesn't it just say, free all your slaves? And then they conclude that, uh, and people from both sides have wrongly concluded this, that the Bible condones slavery. There's people that, uh, if, if the Bible did condone slavery, that would be bad. And there are people that think that it does, and so they, you know, have a response to it of horror. And then there's been people in the past that have uh, believed that it condones slavery, and so they said, then we're going to have our slaves, and that's horrible. Uh, Both of those are wrong. Um, This is instruction for something that was going on already. And uh, that may seem weird to us. We might wonder, why not just say abolish it? Um, Well, one thought is this. There were six million of them. If, if, number one, nobody's going to just let them go because uh, this new Christian religion says, you know, let them all go. They're not. And if they did, what would happen to them? Uh, So there's that. It it wouldn't have gone well. It wouldn't have gone well. Um, but, But here's something else. Even though it doesn't just come right out and say, hey, abolish slavery, the, the Bible powerfully undermines it. Very powerfully. And even in this passage, it, it powerfully undermines the whole thing. Um, and it does that by telling Christians on either side of this, whether you're a slave or a master, how to treat that other person. And, and by default, it's describing treating them utterly differently than slaves and masters would normally treat each other. So in other words, just by the way you're treating them, you wouldn't even really call them a slave anymore. It, 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 and, it, and that undermining that it did, telling Christians... And treat your, your bond servants good. Treat them good. And if you're a bond servant, man, treat, treat your master good. It, 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 uh, by telling Christians to do that, and if a person's a real Christian and they're serious about their relationship with God, that just obliterates the normal uh, relationship of slavery and master there. And, and doing that did eventually destroy slavery everywhere Christianity flourished. Everywhere. Everywhere that Christianity was flourishing, slavery went away. And sadly, places where there's almost no Christianity, there's still slavery today. And a lot of those places are Muslim countries. Anyway, uh, we don't have slavery in our culture, thank God. But these principles work in another area. And here's, here's how that works. The slaves, because there were so many, were a huge part of the workforce, like a vast majority of the workforce at the time. They, they were the workers. They were expected to work. So you can take the principles here and apply them as it relates to being an employee or an employer. When you go to work, you're paid to do a job. So in a way, 
albeit different, but in a way, uh, you, you know, you belong to them during whatever hours you're there and they're paying you for it. And so the Apostle Paul, you know, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this. There's five ways to do that, to, to, to be a good employee. Uh, number one, be obedient. It says, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. So we have one true master. Jesus is our ultimate and true master. Um, but as employees, we look at uh, our bosses and they're, they're masters according to the flesh. That's what our bosses are. Jesus told this parable in Matthew 21. He said, uh, what do you think? A man had two sons. Uh, he said to the first, and he said, you know, go, son, go out and work in the field today. And, and he said, no, I'm not going to do that. And afterward, he felt bad, and so he went out and did it. The other one, he said, son, go out and work in the field today. And he goes, okay, I'll go. Yes, sir. But then he ended up not going. And, and so um, he said, Jesus said, which one of those did the will of his father? And he said, the one that did it. Not the one who said he would do it, but the one who did it. And uh, now as Christians, we don't want to act like either one of these guys. But, but the, the key there is, uh, do what you're supposed to do. Don't have, number one, don't have an attitude with your boss saying no and then, oh, I'm sorry, later. Uh, but also don't say yes to their face knowing that you're not going to do what they say. Um, obey your boss. Do what you're supposed to do. Even if your boss is unreasonable and harsh, uh, the Lord says obey him anyway. Um, now, in the world, you it's completely normal and expected that uh, a jerky boss is going to get treated uh, as they deserve. But uh, we're Christians. We're not supposed to be like that. We're supposed to act like Jesus. Secondly, so be obedient. Secondly, be respectful. It says be obedient with fear and trembling. And that fear there doesn't mean like terror. Uh, it means with respect regarding the position that the, 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 uh, the master is in. Uh, you know, you get pulled over by a cop. Even if you don't think you did anything, it's a good idea to respect his position, right? Respect the fact that he can make things rough on you if he wants to. Um, um, and maybe you think, well, I am respecting him. I pulled over, didn't I? But, you know, they can make it a lot worse than that. So it's foolish to be rude. And, and something like that as it relates to your boss, you know. You, you, remember, you have to answer to this person. That's just how it is. So you have to respect them in light of the fact that this is somebody who has sway over you in a lot of different ways. They, they evaluate you. They get to determine things like, do you get to keep working here? You know, or do you have any future here? Are you going to get a raise or not? Are you going to get promotions or not? And so um, you want to be respectful uh, to them. I don't think I've ever worked anywhere. Wait. Here. I don't really have a boss here. Okay, I, I, most places I've ever worked, just about everywhere I've ever worked, there's always been people who whine and complain about the boss. I mean, it, are, have you guys had the same experience? I mean, that thing is just, that's just rampant. Everybody does this. And, and uh, you know, this is one of the reasons why we should be respectful. You know, when, when, when we think about being set apart, we're trying to stand out as different. Think about all the ways in, in the law, in Exodus, Leviticus, how uh, Deuteronomy, how they're uh, told, um, as my people, here's what you need to do, and, and uh, you need to be a holy people. And this is one of those areas. Everybody complains about their boss. What if, what if Christians just didn't? What if we were just respectful? Be an easy way to stand out. <clears throat> Third, be sincere and consistent. Uh, it also says in verse 5, it says, In sincerity of heart, as to Christ, not with eye service, as men pleasers. Um, you guys know Eddie Haskell? Leave it to Beaver. Perfectly polite, respectful, charming young man whenever... June and Ward, the parents were around. But he didn't mean it because uh, he just wanted to look good in front of the parents. Uh, when they were gone, he was a weasel. 
And so when it says we should be sincere, think, don't be like Eddie Haskell. Don't be, don't be, don't, don't be like that. Don't be a suck up to the boss. Don't just say what he, what they want to hear. Uh, don't just do these things to look good and then, you know, but you act nothing like it most of the time. Uh, it says, have sincerity of heart as unto Christ. You know, um, sometimes it's hard to be respectful to a boss if the boss is difficult. But that's why it says unto Christ. Because you're not doing it for the boss. You're doing it for the one who is your real master, for Jesus. Do it as unto him. Do it as if he were the one you were doing it for. Um, when, when you do it for Jesus, you don't have to fake it, right? If you're doing it for somebody else, there's a lot of times where you just have to fake it. But if you're doing it for Jesus, you don't have to fake it. He died for you. He went to the cross for you. You don't have to fake anything. He's worthy of it all. And so, um, now, uh, your boss isn't worthy of much, you know, maybe, depending. Uh, but Jesus is worth, worthy of everything, so... Um, so anyway, it just means just don't don't just work hard when the boss is uh, when when you think you're being watched. Uh, I saw a sticker. I haven't seen it in a while, but I've seen it a number of times. Uh, bumper sticker. It says, uh, "Jesus is coming. Look busy." You ever seen that one? So obviously, it's kind of a mocking of our expectation of his return, but um, you know. People are like that at work. The boss is coming, look busy, kind of thing. And so, um, but don't do that. Character is, it's been said, character is what you do when nobody's watching. So you want to have good character as an employee. Back to Eddie Haskell. Um, as, as sneaky and weaselly as he was, he, Ward and June uh, weren't fooled at all. You know, he'd leave the room and they'd be like, oh, that kid, what a character. You know, they, they knew. They weren't, they weren't dumb. They knew, they knew what he was like. And if you're the kind of person who's, you know, kind of fake to your work, to your boss, you know, works only hard when you're being watched, number one, God's already on to you. And probably, if they're not yet, they will be at work soon anyway. So be sincere when you serve the Lord at work. Uh, also be diligent. It says, but bond servants of Christ, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of, the, of God from the heart, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So uh, key words here, from the heart and as to the Lord. So again, we, we know who our real master is, uh, not the boss, but Jesus. Um, and you're doing it for him. Um, and again, think about how different, like really, just imagine a scenario at work. Maybe one you don't like, a situation you hate, something. Work, home, school, whatever. Now picture it with Jesus hanging out with you right there. Think about your normal way that you would do it and respond. And then just try to imagine, would that be okay if Jesus was right there with you? It would probably change pretty significantly, you know, in certain things. You know, do you watch the clock a lot at work? You know, constantly looking at the clock. You know, picking up your phone a lot and playing with your phone. And you're supposed to be working, stuff like that. Would you do that if Jesus was with work at work with you? Uh, what about the quality of your work? Would you just rush through it? I'm just gonna get this done. Who cares how good I do it? Or would you do it well? I mean, I'm pretty sure it would change a lot. Um, and and it says with goodwill. So that's like, don't just do it for Jesus, but but do it. Uh, Do it with a good attitude for Jesus. Again, think about all that he's done for you and, and uh, apply 
that attitude that I would that he's so worthy of of what I do and apply that to work. So when you go to work, you go if you go to an office, I am a Christian in this office. Or you you know, you go to a warehouse, you work in a warehouse. I'm a representative of the kingdom of heaven in this warehouse. You know, or I met this company or I, whatever it is, wherever you go. Um, and so, yeah, I do it for the company, but even more so, it's for him. Uh, fifthly, remember where the real reward comes from when you're working. Verse 8 says, Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Um, so it's important to know that your diligence at your job does matter to God. Uh, and that's important. The reason why that's important to try to remember sometimes is because it's not uncommon for diligence at your job to go unnoticed or unthanked. You know, here you are, you put all this effort in, you give it your all, and either nobody notices or worse, they come at you like, what have you been doing? What are you even doing? And you're like, ready to go to blows. You're like, what are you, you say that to me again? You know, that kind of thing. And so, uh, or, or, it, or it comes another way. You've been just giving it your all for a year and it's like raise time and like they either don't give you one or it's puny or, you know, the promotion doesn't come or someone else gets it and you know they're a slacker or something like that. And um, that, kind of, that kind of stuff can be hard. And, but God, God notices. He, he sees all things. He won't let it go unrewarded. He's going to use it to build the character in you, which is really ultimately worth way more than a raise or a, a promotion. Uh, you know, as nice as a raise or a promotion in the here and now can be, he's still going to use that uh, uh, in a greater way. And, and so as Christians, we want to work hard to honor the Lord, not just for our own glory and our own, you know, temporal benefit, but for the glory of God. And, and, and he'll notice even if nobody else does. And so of all people, Christians ought to have a very good work ethic. Uh, we should be the kind of people that other people want to hire. Uh, we should have. We should be the kind of people that the the work doesn't want to. The job, the company doesn't want to lose. Uh, we should have uh, a reputation. I had this Christian working for me. All he was ever doing was just praising the Lord. He wasn't getting any work done. Look, it's good to witness to people. That's not what they're paying you for, and that's a fact. So you know, you do your job, and if you have opportunity, then you know. And, and it's done without them, you know, without you neglecting your responsibility as an employee, then go for it. But, but you want to have a reputation, like you don't want to have a, give a reputation. Don't hire a Christian. All they ever do is tell everybody about Jesus and they don't do any work. That would be horrible. We don't want that kind of reputation. We want a reputation that, man, this Christian, that guy's a Christian. He worked hard. He'd pray before work and then he'd work hard all day or whatever. And so one, one more point here. Um, if these principles apply to a employment situation, then they also should very much apply to uh, work done uh, in serving the Lord, like a, in a volunteer uh, capacity where you serve at church or, or in some other ministry. If we're, all those things should be equally uh, applied in scenarios like that. And again, we do it unto Him. Um, and we want to do that when we're volunteering the Lord. Because if we're doing it under the Lord when I'm getting paid, what, I'm not going to do it under the Lord when I'm not getting paid? I mean, that just doesn't, right? That doesn't make any sense. We understand that. And uh, uh, sometimes people are like that, though. Oh, it's okay if I don't show up. Oh, it's okay if I'm late. Oh, it's okay if I don't do, do it real well. Oh, it's okay if I don't prepare. Oh, it's okay if I just, you know, bail whenever I, I don't feel like coming this time. And, and uh, uh, 
I don't really want to do it because they're not letting me do it the way I want to do it anyway. If I, if they, I would do it, but they don't let me do it the way I want to do it. None of that's under the Lord. And so um, that means you're not really a servant either, by the way. So uh, do, do all, all your work, whether paid or volunteer, unto the Lord. And then the last part is for the employers, the bosses. Um, it says in you, verse 9, masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master is also in heaven and there's no partiality with him. So the masters, um, it, it's, if, the, if the slaves' instructions apply to us as it relates being em, employees, uh, then this also applies to bosses, supervisors, whoever your boss is, or if you're a boss. And it says real simply, do the same things to them. He basically is saying all that that I just said to the employ employees, that goes for you too. That goes for you too. See, that's where this whole like, you would never say that to, this is where the gospel, this is where Christianity undermines the slavery condition. Because that would be unheard of. Hey, masters, treat your, treat your uh, employees, be fair to them, be good to them, treat them like, you know. And later on in, uh, what is it, uh, Philemon, because he's talking about a runaway slave, he, he says, treat them like your, you know, he's your brother. So he's telling this, this master to treat this slave like a brother because he is. And so, um, uh, now, there's one difference, of course. There's roles in the employee-employer relationship, right? And somebody actually is in charge, so there is somebody that gets to call the shots. But you can call the shots and still treat them really well in all these other ways. And that's what he's saying to do. So, you, okay, you're the boss. You still get to call the shots, but be respectful, be sincere, be consistent, be diligent. Remember who your real master is. And in a nutshell, uh, don't treat them like you own them. That's where the undermining of slavery comes in. Don't treat them like you own them. Don't treat them like they're a piece of property. And, and, a, and a boss, a, a job, the same thing. Uh, treat them like people. Treat them like they're valuable. Treat them like they have feelings. Treat them like somebody who's trying, if they are. And uh, th treat them like somebody that might need some input, need some encouragement. Doesn't, doesn't need to be uh, threatened. He says, give up threatening. Don't, don't be a boss that just goes around threatening all the time. I'm going to, you're going to get fired. I'm going to dock your pay. You know, whatever. I, what, I don't know what, I don't know how people threaten their employees. But don't do that. Uh, give that up. And that happens, right? People, there's bosses like that. Uh, Sometimes bosses just flip their lids, you know, they just yell all the time, screaming, whatever. Other times it's, you know, more, more uh, calm, but still a threat. You know, you're going to lose your job. I'm telling you. I mean, there's times when that needs to happen, but you don't want to just be a threatening, kind of trying to keep your employees in submission by scaring them all the time for a threat of losing their job. He says, don't be that kind of boss. Remember, you have a boss too. Even the boss has a boss. Your master is in heaven. If you're a boss, remember you got a boss. Even if you're the CEO, you got a boss. And so um, don't lead with a heavy hand. Don't supervise with uh, threatening. Uh, be kind. Be good. Um, Remember, they're going to make mistakes. Remember, you, yeah, you still have to do stuff. You have to give reviews and all that kind of stuff. But you don't want to aggravate people and uh, that kind of thing. So as Christians, we have these different relationships. And, and the, the ones related here, the family and work, I mean, that's a huge part of our lives, right? You're, you're at home with your family and you're at work with the people you work with. And so we want to reflect Jesus in those things. And he's given us good principles here how to do that. Father, we thank you for your word. We praise you. Lord, bless our families. Uh, bless parents. Help us to honor our own parents. Bless us at our jobs. Help us to be uh, good representatives of Jesus in 
and a, of our relationship to you at our work. And if we are in any, any role of supervision, of uh, authority at work, then all the more help us to uh, do it in a godly, Christ-like way. Lord, we love you. Bless the rest of our week. Uh, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.